at Salvador Hilla uh, Research Seminar. Our speaker today is Alba Santos, who is a PhD student at the BSC, whose work focuses on how atmospheric com composition affects climate variability. Um, in May of this year, Alba won a competitive Salvador Hilla Mobility Grant, which is the um, source of the research she'll tell you about today. And I think I think I'll just let you. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Mary-Kate. So thank you for coming. Um, as Mary-Kate has said, um, I'm here to present my work. And the title is Cooling in a Warming World, Near-Time Climate Forcers. I hope to that everybody gets uh, out of this seminar knowing what near-time climate forces are. Because before my PhD, I didn't know. <laughs> so just to put it into context, uh, I'm going to give a timeline of what's been my research. Uh, on February in last year, I started my PhD. The title of the thesis is Effects of Non-CO2 Forces Upon Climate, um, which is a broader topic than most. But uh, what we started doing was uh, working on output from some IPSIC simulations, model data, uh, to try to isolate the effects of these species Then I will tell you about uh, in the next slide. And... Uh, Speed up to June of this year, I went and did a research stay at Reading. Specifically, I worked on, with the University of Reading and the National Center of Atmospheric Sciences, ENCAS. And there I was hosted by Professor John Robson. He uh, is specialized on Atlantic variability and the AMOC, uh, which is uh, the Atlantic Circula Meridional Overturning Circulation. Uh, I will tell you more about it later. And it was a really nice experience. I got to present my results with the climate uh, dynamic, climate and oceanic dynamics, ocean dynamics group. Um, and in a seminar much like this one, and I got really good feedback from them that really helped me develop my research further. So, and in the future, uh, the plan is to continue the collaboration with John, uh, keep working on, on the analysis, and hopefully present a paper with, with what we got. So I like this uh, slide because it mm, sums up what it's going to be the, the seminar today, the presentation. I start doing a brief, brief um, sum up of uh, the initial analysis that led me to the research stay. I'll... Um, also um, delve further into what I did uh, there in Reading, and then uh, some of a slide of, of what the future works uh, that we are planning on. So let's start with uh, the beginning. <laughs> um, what are near-time climate forces? So near-time climate forces are atmospheric species that uh, have short atmospheric lifetimes. We're talking about less than two decades. and we are going to focus here on anthropogenic uh, aerosols, tropospheric ozone, and their precursors. What makes uh, these species interesting is that each of these species have different radiative effects. So, for example, um, scattering aerosols like sulfates uh, reflect light. Uh, trop tropospheric ozone acts as a greenhouse gas, keeping uh, radiation and, and energy into the, in a, into the atmosphere, and therefore having a warming net effect. Uh, other aerosols, for example, black carbon absorbs light, also having a, a warming effect. So we have a complex situation here, but it's also complex that uh, because they have atmos short atmospheric lifetimes, they are not um, well mixed like CO2 in the atmosphere. Like you can see uh, different points of the earth have similar concentrations of CO2 because these uh, species don't stay for longer for long into the atmosphere. They are really localized and so they can have global effects but also really uh, local effects. So really interesting but uh, kind of complex. So how are we approaching this? Uh, in the initial analysis we decided to focus on the historical period, specifically specifically between 1950 to 2014. And uh, for to try to isolate the effects of these species we uh, took two different simulations from the semip 6 Arkham MIP and, uh, initiative. Basically an intermodal comparison initiative. Um, the historical simulation uh, follows what happened, tries to mimic what, uh, what happened during the past. 
with the same uh, historical forcings. But then the HIST PNTCF, uh, historical pre-industrial near-time climate forcers, um, follows the same historical forcing except for near-time climate forces, which uh, fixes to uh, 1850 values, pre-industrial values. So by comparing the both of them, we will be able to isolate the impacts of these historical emissions. Um, these are the, the simulations, and then uh, there you have a list of the four Earth system models that we are analyzing, that we are uh, studying. Basically, to for to the to take this selection, we uh, forced two requirements that all the models considered have inter interactive tropospheric uh, chemistry and aerosols. This way, we ensure that we are able to capture the nature and the effects. Uh, of these species into into climate, and uh, that the all of them contribute with three members, three run simulation runs to each of the of the simulations. This way, we can filter a little bit the um, the internal variability of the models and focus on the forced signal. That that's what we want to to study, right? So um, let's see what we have, what we are working with. Uh, how these chemical species um, evolve in the historical period. So here you can see tropospheric ozone at 500 hectopascals. Uh, this is going to be the usual maps you have. Uh, I will show you the historical reference and then the comparison between the, the simulations. This way you can see the force signal in the, in the comparison, OK? So in, for the ozone, you see that there's an increase in tropospheric concentrations, in tropospheric ozone concentrations, but it's um, more intense in the northern hemisphere, which makes sense since uh, most anthropogenic sources are located in this hemisphere. We're talking about Europe, uh, North America, and East Asia. Uh, but we, if we look into the um, uh, time evolution, here I have to go up here. Um, there you can see global means for the tropospheric ocean concentration uh, during the, um, the years considered. You can see that uh, for the two experiments, the solid line is the historical. The, um, the dashed line is with the pre-industrial uh, uh, simulation. So you can see that uh, the increasing trends of the historical um, simulations far exceeds the pre-industrial uh, trends. And the, the difference between the simulations are, are consistent in all, all the four models. Now, what about aerosols, the other species that we talked we are considering? So it's the same, right? In the left side panels, you have the historical reference, and in the uh, right hand side, you have the the signal between simulations. So you can see that here is far more localized to uh, the emission sources. Especially if you look into the MRISM, you can see Europe, North America, and East Asia, right? Uh, again, there's an increase in in these regions, and the same as before, you have the global mean uh, evolution. I'm going to address the elephant in the room. The spikes in the MRI model is because volcanic emissions. Uh, all models consider volcanic emissions, but because MRI resolves the stratosphere, um, the this um, optical depth of the um, of the volcanic emissions is included into the variable. This variable we are taking as a proxy of the um, of aerosol concentration, but it's actually optical depth, but aerosol concentrations. So if we take it, uh, out the spikes, you can see that while the, um, the pre-industrial setup uh, stays, the concentrations stay stable, the historical setup trend varies with time. So if you can see that before the 1980s, you have a rising trend, and then somehow it stabilizes uh, for the Pass, uh, for the next decades. If we put it into the political context of the world, it makes sense since in 1980s, um, a stricter um, air quality policies were enforced in Europe and North America. 
and therefore the aerosol emissions in those uh, places uh, lowered, whereas in East Asia, they continue to rise. So somehow in the last decades, they counteract each other. So we have some global uh, stable concentrations. This is important because as we said, uh, these species have local effects. So if the source, the um, emission source matters into what effects on climate they, they are gonna have. So now, um, as I said, near-term climate forcers uh, have different radiative effects. They exert their impact into climate but via their interaction with light, with uh, solar radiation. Um, so here you have uh, the same map, but with the net radiation. It's, this means the absorbed radiation, the radiation that gets uh, stays into the system, in the Earth system. Uh, if you focus on the um, on the um, difference between simulations, you see that there's a uh, an decrease in absorbed radiation in the um, main uh, regions of emission sources, Europe, America, and East Asia. But all in all, there's uh, really an interhemispheric difference. In the northern hemisphere, there's a cooling. It, this means less absorbed radiation, whereas in the southern hemisphere, you get uh, more absorbed radiation. This uh, plot tells us two things. Uh, first, the aerosols, specifically scattering aerosols, are the main forces here because they are the only species we are considering that they actually have a cooling effect. And then we also see that because there's this interhemispheric signal and since radiation uh, energy is what drives Earth's climate, we are we potentially will see some impact in global circulation, not only local effects. If we look, um, because we want to quantify further this inter interhemispheric radiation signal, we uh, computed the this interhemispheric index. Basically what it does is uh, quantify the difference in absorbed radiation between hemispheres, southern hemisphere minus northern hemisphere. So you can see that for all the four models, you have uh, for the historical um, simulation, you have higher values of this of these, uh, index, which basically means more difference between, uh, more imbalance between hemispheres. And also something that it's interesting of this plot is that some it resembles the um, pre-80s, post-80s change trend that we saw in the aerosol global concentration. And also that the difference between models, uh, between simulations among models, is is different. So each model um, will have a different strength in the signal because uh, because of this. Well, it's interesting. So uh, this is the uh, impact in radiation, and after. Much analysis, we detected three main signals in the historical period, which you see here. Uh, the first one over this is the um, difference in in the simulations in the surface temperature, uh, the temperature at the surface of the of of the Earth, of the atmosphere, and here you can see an overall cooling because of the presence of near term climate forces, but it's uh, especially intense in the northern hemisphere and in the um, in the Arctic. This um, is a known effect of sea ice uh, in temperature as sea ice has higher albedo than sea surface. If you get cooler temperatures, you get more ice, then um, there's more radiation reflected back into the atmosphere. So you, this contributes to farther cooler temperatures and it's a, a positive feedbacks that um, agrees with this higher intensity signal into the Arctic. Uh, we analyzed the sea ice and we saw that for the all the models that we had in data, um, we ha we had more sea ice surface um, when in the presence of near term climate forces. Then we also saw a signal in the precipitation. Here you can see the, the, the same uh, difference between simulations in the precipitation um in the historical period and if you focus on the tropics you see that below the equator you uh, have higher precipitation whereas uh, at the north of the equator you have less precipitation this um is consistent with a southward displacement of the intertropical convergence zone which could be um 
the effects of this interhemispheric difference in radiation that uh, led to um, southward displacement of the atmospheric circulation. Because if you have uh, more energy in the southern hemisphere, you will get a shift downwards, southwards. And lastly, and the one the, the one signal we will be focusing today um, is the Labrador Sea variability. So in red, uh, you see circled the Labrador Sea. This is the change in variability um, between the two simulations. So in green, you will see that there's increased variability in the area. So um, this uh, consistent signal uh, means that because near time climate forces, we actually see something happening there. We looked farther into it and we detected that there's uh, in the ocean column, um, like water, um, there's increased convection in the area due to near time climate forces. And that's what we are gonna um, look farther. So um, here, what you see is uh, mixed layer depth, which is the, um, the um, amount of ocean that it's being mixed during the February, March, April season, which is the season of uh, maximum deeper convection. And you see that because of near time climate forces in all four models, uh, you get uh, a thicker mixed layer depth, which means that the, it's, um, the properties of the water in the column uh, is less stratified. It's more homogeneous in this la mixed layer. And therefore, it's a signal of increased convection, as I said. Our proposed mechanism, uh, what we think it's happening here is that because near term climate forces are affecting uh, the relative fluxes of the area, they are producing a cooling of the, of the surface, of the sea surface, which leads to higher density. And uh, because of the if the water at the surface is denser, you will get um, more vertical mixing, which in turn, because the subsurface waters of the Labrador Sea are saltier than, than the surface, if you increase uh, mixing, you will get saltier waters back into the surface, which will feed back uh, into the higher density, more convection, more vertical mixing and everything. This is what we think it's happening. Now I'm gonna give you the proof. <laughs> So looking at ocean profiles, um, as I said, density, temperature, salinity, they are um, main characteristics of ocean, uh, ocean waters and ocean dynamics. So here you can see the same kind of plots as before, the historical reference and down uh, the comparison between experiments for these three variables, temperature, salinity, and density. What we see is that um, if you look at F, all the, um, we see an increase in density, in surface density especially, led by um, sal higher salinity and cooler temperatures. Whatever is happening here, we think that it's not the pure mechanism. So we are looking at um, a mixed signal, both the driver and the response. Because we have a feedback loop, feedback feedback loop, we will be seeing also the salinity increase that um, that brings the subsurface waters uh, being uh, brought to the surface. So what we decided to try to isolate the first driver, we did um, this this plot. Basically, this is the the density contributions of temperature and salinity. Uh, we're going back months, so from April, the um, which is the um, the lighter shade, which is the maximum convection time, to October when convection has not still uh, be started to work in the area. So uh, if you look at the bottom uh, bottom plots, this is really interesting. Uh, you can see that. This is uh, first column is density. Second column. Uh, contribution to density from temperature and third contribution uh, from salinity. So um, you see that for October, temperature uh, contribution is, um, ha it's goes um, head to head with the um, 
with the salinity contribution, but as time goes by, it um, is diminishes up to nothing as compared to salinity. Here, what we think are seeing is that temperature is um, is the driving the this uh, convection response. But um, as the feedback, the convection is triggered, you start seeing the that the response overdrives the the forcing, the primal the primal forcing, primary forcing, and because salinity is somehow maintained during the during the months, we attribute this to the fact that salinity has um, more um, persistence in the in water because salinity uh, signal can stay um, stay for longer times and it stays from year to year. So this one is cool. What we conclude of this initial analysis is that aerosols are the main forcers uh, out of all the species considered. Um, we see an interhemispheric radiation signal that can potentially um, have global uh, global consequences and, and effects. We see that uh, there's increased convection in the Labrador Sea and it's driven by temperature and all of these signals are being included into a paper that I'm we are writing. <laughs> Stay tuned. So, but what's next? This is what before I went to Reading. Now, um, for to try to continue with this work, uh, we wanted to focus on the Labrador Sea. So we decided to look forward, look into the future. So um, our new framework is kind of um, similar, uh, analogous to the historical analysis. But uh, in this case, we are assessing the impact in future climate. For that, we are also using semi epsic simulations. But in this case, the experiments are projections based on shared pathways. If it's like, um, some guidelines of what future can look like. And in this case, uh, this is a pretty bad future, <laughs> it's but because if we compare with a pretty bad future, we will get higher signals, right? Um, so the historical before, now it will be this projection, this reference. And then the other experiment is the SSP 370, 37, uh, but low near-time climate forces. Basically, it follows the same pathway, but with uh, low concentrations of near-time climate forces. Again, if we compare the both, we will be able to isolate the near-time climate forces impacts. Uh, uh, the requirements that uh, for the model selection, it was that, again, they, all the models selected had inter interactive tropospheric chemistry and aerosols, but they also had to um, have some AMOC variables available because we wanted to look at the AMOC. We, it's not a common variable, not a necessary common, common variable. So we decided that all the models had to have that. And we ended up with eight models, uh, 22 members in total. Really nice ensemble. So again, let's see what uh, the chemistry is going looking like. We see um same his uh, projection reference and then the comparison between uh, experiments in the comparison between experiments we see that there's an increase in concentrations obviously but it's of a lower intensity than in the, in the historical period and also uh we get higher concentrations in the northern hemisphere in global means uh, time series um, this is interesting because, as you can see, both of the simulations in this case um, start from the same point, uh, start point. It's different as before, uh, be because the historical uh, simulations started way longer than the, our study period. They were in you know, already different states. In this case, they start from the, different, from the same state. So we will expect that from in the first decade, we will not see a much signal much of a signal. This is one of the of the reasons why from future analysis that you will see, we focus, uh, we start in 2025 instead of 2015. I didn't say it, but we are looking from 2015 to 2055. Uh, uh, here you can see that in the reference, in the project uh, SSP 37, 
the ocean ozone concentrations um, grow, whereas in the other one, uh, in the low NTCF uh, simulation, they they go down. This is new. Uh, up to now, it, in all the simulations, the concentrations were rising. So maybe this also affects what, what we see. Just interesting to look at and to have it in mind. And with respect to aerosols, um, this is also uh, a good point. When we look into the difference between experiments, we see that the difference is focused on East Asia. This uh, follows uh, the say the what I said uh, to you before. East Asia is um, a region where the concentrations are rising, so the difference uh, and is going to be focused there. And with respect to global concentrations, we have the same. Uh, in the reference, it's more more or less stable, and in the low NTCF, the concentrations uh, are lowering, are falling. Okay, so radiation signal looks a bit like this. Mm, again, somehow interhemispheric difference, but a weaker signal than in the historical period. And with respect to the interhemispheric difference, we see that um, the trends also resemble the aerosol, um, the aerosol trends. In this case, it's also the ozone trends. It's uh, from the reference, it's somehow stable, and for the uh, low NTCF, the the, the interhemispheric difference um, decays. False. We see that there's a less difference between experiments, and in all in all, lower. Uh, index values, which means that there are less energetic imbalance between the in the between the experiments, between the setups. But what is happening in the Labrador Sea? Here you can see um, the a climatology. A climatology of the mixed layer depth, if you remember the vertical mixing in the Labrador Sea area. So in the top uh, panel, you have the historical uh, climatology, and in the bottom panel, you have the, the future, the projections. Uh, we see, well, mind the different y-axis, there's uh, some difference, but not that big. Um, if you look the in the top one, um, the solid lines for each model are uh, way um, higher than uh, the dashed lines in the during the months of deeper convection whereas this difference is more is less in the future uh, projections in some cases it's even negative if for being more clear about it you can see same uh, panels as uh, in the historical period you can see that there are more models spread there are models that report a uh, higher convection in the area, but there are also models that reports uh, weaker convection due to the presence of near-time climate forces, and there are some that don't have um, a significant significant signal. If uh, Because we selected models that could actually uh, look into the AMOC because they had AMOC variables available, uh, I will present to you some uh, some the impact on the AMOC itself, the atmospheric meridional overturn circulation, the Atlantic not atmospheric, sorry. So this is uh, the same reference and comparison between experiments of this um, mass stream function. function. Um, you can see that because of near-time climate forces, there's an increase uh, in the maximum of, of the circulation and yeah, this is cool. Mm. If we uh, also, what we did was select a, like quantified with an index uh, for the maximum uh, stream function in the in the for the thirty five latitude. Um, we have the the AMOC index, which in this case for the first uh, decades you see that it's more or less stable with a little bit of going down. And then uh, it starts decaying. To put it a little bit of context into it, if you're not familiar with the AMOC, 
uh, this uh, circulation is really important for European climate as it transports um, uh, energy and heat from the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere. And there's uh, it's an unbalanced uh, system. It's what it's called a tipping element. If forced past the threshold, it will collapse or go into a new state that will have uh, severe impacts in on climate and on the different systems and in our lives. So here you can see that in this um, projection, the amok is actually decaying. We don't see a tipping point, but it's decaying along the along the decades. And what we see in the second panel is that the presence of near-term climate forces uh, strengthens the amok. Um, again, because we have a, a greater ensemble, we have some variability, but we, especially the geese key. <laughs> there are models and models, <laughs> but all in all, we see an strengthening over the years with a strong variability that's also interesting to, to look into. So the conclusions of, uh, of these results is that, as I said, we have a greater ensemble, which is uh, good, and it strengthens the, the confidence in our results as do with the model analysis. But that this means that we have a greater model spread, natural uh, and really enriching. Different models represent different processes um, and we can learn from that. We detect the same signals as in the historical period, the inter-hemispheric radiation imbalance, uh, the increased convection in the Labrador Sea, but we see a weaker forcing, both a weaker signal and a weaker forcing. And because there are less difference in our in in our simulations, with respect in, to near term climate forces uh, concentrations, and uh, focusing on the amok, we report a strengthening of the amok um, when we have higher concentrations of near term climate forces. But what's next? <laughs> um, so this is here. Um, I ask for your thoughts really, because uh, we have uh, gone until now, but we need to know where we go from here. So we have three, these, I have uh, put these three lines of of, of work, um, but we're open for everything. So the first one uh, is to expand the study to the whole subpolar North Atlantic. This would mean uh, not only take a study and taking into account the Labrador Sea signal, but uh, all the regions of deep uh, water formation of the of the Atlantic that contributes to the amok, which could be interesting because it doesn't mean that the, um, the Labrador Sea is the main contributor to to the circulation, and it doesn't mean that the near term climate forces affect more than near the the deep uh, water formation there and and not the other places. We also thought about expanding uh, to Europe. And this way, uh, we can assess the impact on actual um, assess the impacts of near-term climate forces and the policies that regulate their emission on populated areas. Uh, as we know that the Atlantic has a great impact on on Europe climate, this would be also interesting and relevant to society directly. Um, also, another line of thought would be to focus on the mechanisms behind the near-term climate forces. But since we have suggested a, a mechanism for the Labrador Sea, but we don't haven't really looked into the um, heat fluxes, into the um, what, uh, how is uh, the near-term climate forces specifically uh, exert, uh, um, forcing the the temperature? Like we haven't gone that deep. Maybe now we can do that. Um, this also, um, like focusing on the mechanisms, it means also to um, study the interconnections between Labrador Sea, uh, North Atlantic convection, and the AMOC itself, uh, for considering various uh, timescales, not only annual, but also multi-annual, as we saw that there was uh, multi-annual variability for a lot of models, maybe uh, this would be enriching in the, in the analysis. Other line of thought would be to, um, because we have a great ensemble, we can uh, evaluate how uh, the different models um, represent the different mechanisms being at play and actually exploiting them. So we can um, maybe differentiate between models that um, 
have high higher com deeper conviction than others try to exploit it to understand better better what the physical relationships happening in in the um, in the atlantic uh circulation and i am less than 40 minutes but uh, that's all thank you for your attention and that's my mail Thank you.